Now, as we look at the book of Ruth, remember the story that we are saying that this is not a love story. We are not just waiting for Boaz, who now appears in chapter 2, to like be the end-all hero. This is not a Disney princess movie. This is about ongoing and multiple redeeming relationships that happen. And last week we talked a little bit about Naomi or Mara being bitter and the gift of Ruth and the gift of Jesus to us where it thinks that we have nothing in our hands. We actually have this relationship with Jesus who came for us. And now we have Naomi finding a relative. It starts with chapter 2. There is a man who's standing there, and his name is Boaz. And this is like a, just a FYI, if you've forgotten, if you're reading the book of Ruth. Just, here's a guy called Boaz. He's from the right family. And Naomi needs food. She's come back into a land where she has no husband, and there's some processes going on that Ruth knows that she can go and glean in the fields. It's going to be important. And she says, let me, the younger one, you know, the one who can still bend with her knees and back, go and pick up the leftover grain in anyone's fields that I find favour. So Naomi encourages her and says, go ahead, my daughter. And it turns out, it just happens to turn out, (gasps) coincidence, (laughs) that it was Boaz from the same tribe as Naomi's husband. Oh, look at that. I wonder how that happened. And so while there was a soap opera cliff moment, like, dum, 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 is Naomi going to return and her daughter's going to go with her? There are also these moments of God's provision where it's not a coincidence and it's not a happenstance and Ruth doesn't just happen to turn up into Boaz's fields. This is God. So if you remember from the worldview of the time, one, God is always in control. And two, God is always speaking about how he will keep his covenant promises, which means that he will care for those who are widowed and orphaned and those who are sojourning, those who are refugees or yet to find home and community. This is not a fickleness of circumstance like every time I put out the washing it rains. This is God moving his hand to be at work for the least of these. And then we meet Boaz, who seems to be the most of these. Uh, Boaz, it seems, is the good guy in the story because this story, too, is a microcosm. That is a smaller story of the, what's happening in Israel. So we had Naomi, who struggled but is honest with her faith, We have Boaz who stands tall and has been in his faith forever and ever and ever, it seems. And we know this. We know that the author is trying to tell us that Boaz is a good guy because it's how he speaks. In verse 4, just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted his harvest, the Lord be with you. I can't do it as cheesy as that American accent. Because this is a story of a small family, but it's also the story of a nation. It's the biggest story of God's people, in this case, some who are faithful. And it's the biggest story is God's providence. Boaz says, the Lord be with you. And they answer, the Lord bless you. This interaction is a first clue that Boaz is in some good standing in the land, but also in good standing with God, how he speaks to the people around him. And then the next clue is this, that Boaz turns to his harvesters and he asks in verse 5, who does that woman belong to? Like, Boaz is a good guy. He knows who his neighbors are. He knows that this woman isn't from this town. And he knows that she's not a neighbor, but not in a bad way. Like when someone new moves in and you kind of put your hand over the fence and you're like, oh yeah, they've got a TV. Have they got a spa? Have they got Sky? (laughs) Boaz is the good guy because how he speaks and what he knows about his neighborhood, but also what he does. He knew enough of his neighbors to know that Ruth was different And it goes on to say that this is Ruth the Moabitess 
Four times in this chapter, Ruth is described as the other. And every time, Boaz still welcomes her in and gives her the same rights to glean as he would any other woman of Israel. This is the worldview of Boaz, too, that everything starts and finishes with God, and there is power in these covenant promises. And one of these covenant promises were that Israelites were supposed to keep the law. And here we go, guys, because I'm super excited about gleaning laws. I really love history, so here we go. I'm, I'm actually, I love it. I love it. In Leviticus 19 and 19 and 9 and 10, it says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap the first field right up to the edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you should not strip your vineyard bare, and neither should you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner, because I am the Lord. And then Deuteronomy 24, 19 to 21. When you reap the harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow, that the Lord may bless you in all the work of your hands. And when you beat your olive trees, you do not go over them again, for it will be for the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow. And when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you should not strip it afterwards, for it should be for the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow. These laws found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy are commandments for the people of Israel spoken by the prophet Moses. They are commandments, not afterthoughts. Not, well, if I've collected enough for my harvest this year and my family's got enough, then I'll do this. They are commandments. And the summarized version of these obligations are this. They were to leave the margins of their fields unharvested. They were not to pick up any produce that fell on the ground during the course of harvesting. And they were only to harvest their produce just once. So too benefit the sojourner, the widow, and the fatherless. So too benefit those without resources those without financial resources, those without inheritance or land resources, those without strength like Naomi, or those who are left without kith and kin. And again, please note, church, that these laws are legal obligations on every farmer, which was pretty much everyone of the day. Everyone had their bit of land where we were growing those things. Now, in Christmas time, I am going to Tonga, and I can't wait, one, because it's going to be warm, but two, Sione's family has land, and there are mangoes, and there are pawpaws, and there are watermelons, and there are, like, oh, pineapples. And I'm not going to pay $11 a kilo for it. <laughs> And like Tonga is now, so the land of Israel was there. Everyone had a bit of family land that were going. And so everyone in the whole place was required not to go up to the edges, not to strip everything off. They were open to their land and their fields and their vineyards, their plum trees if they had them, cherries, their pawpaws, so to speak. But why? Well, these are ultimate because I said so, says God. I am your Lord. Now, unlike the authority move that my parents called, I don't want to go to bed. Well, I told you so. Why? Because I said so. You know? <laughs> this is a because I said so in the nicest of ways. This was a remembering law where God has said, I am reminding the people of Israel that I have led them out of economic oppression in Egypt, and I have given them a place to thrive, and I was the one that provided from the desert. The people gleaned from my goodness of quail and manna that I provided for you. And so in the many long years that I provided for you, this is now your turn to provide for one another. These gleaning laws reminded the people of Israel that one God was their provision. And that the, of an action of their obedience to a God that loved them. The gleaning laws were a reminder that there was obedience required to a God who loved them, not just to receive the love and do nothing with it, 
but to do something with it. Three, in these gleaning laws, you notice that the people are not absent from each other. There are owners of fields and workers of fields and farmers and farm daughters and, and, the, and the sons out at the same time as those of the community who come in to glean and they worked together. A community worked together for the good of sustaining itself. And then the last one, that work is something good for everyone's soul. Whether you're retired, retried, or whether you're still working, whatever you do with your hands is goodness. There is only so much you can sit at home and do nothing. And whether your work is your garden, or whether your work is that thing you do for money, whether your work is praying for this church, or whether your work is being in this church, and thank you for all the people that do all of those things. Working brings purpose. And so we have this gleaning laws that remembers that God is provision and that we need to be obedient and that we can't be distant from each other and for us to work in some way or another is good. And Boaz knew these laws. This is why he opened his field up, probably to more than Ruth, but because Ruth is the character, this is the one we get to hear about. And the good guy Boaz offers more than the usual gleaning laws, more than just the scraps on the side of the field. He says, come, come and eat with me, come and drink with my fellow workers. And guys, by the way, just drop some extra stuff for her and don't worry about it. It's cool, it's cool. And he does this because he says, I've heard for everything that you've done for your mother-in-law. I know how you've cared for her since she's been dead. And I know how you've come in to live with the people who are not your people. And then he says this, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. And may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz is reminded and reminding Ruth that God is the source of their provision. And so Boaz invites her to to eat and dine, and there is no hint of love going on, but faithful obedience of Boaz and God's provision for Ruth. Ruth is given protection and food, and Boaz encourages her harvesters to be a little bit droppy. (laughs) And as she comes home, Naomi, though she calls herself bitter, she is the only one that calls herself that. In the book, she is always called Naomi, apart from when she talks of herself. It's not left empty. She has Ruth, and she has Ruth, who has a harvest beyond measure. And of course, she has God. And Naomi, in her surprise, says, where did you glean today? And where did you, where did you work? And blessed be the man that you worked for. And it's Boaz, of course it is. Because this is God's provision. May the Lord bless him, Naomi says, which is interesting because she's not herself feeling the blessing of the Lord, but still she knows how the system works, that God is the one who provides. For he has not sh- stopped showing the kindness And then Ruth adds this extra bit, you know, like he says, stay with me, stay with me, little sister, until the harvest is finished, which is about three months worth of work. This is three months of Boaz losing out on more than just the grains in the corner of his fields. This is a long-term economic loss for him, and he thinks nothing of it. For this is what his service to God is. And it wasn't just a one-off service. It wasn't like 10% of the tithe after tax before earnings and savings. This is something that he did with generosity out of his obedience to God because he knows that God has provided for not just a day or a week or one month, but three months. And even though she's not kith or kin, remember four times we've read that she was a Moabites. Because we all know it's easy to take care of you or yours. But remembering that Boaz is a picture of Israel. Israel is blessed to be a blessing and blessed to honor God and blessed to honor and care for other people. And if the characters of Ruth tell this larger story, and they are a worthwhile example to us. What can we learn from it, church? 
I think we can learn to know our neighbors enough to know who is new. That is for those who walk in this door, but for literally our neighbors as they move into our neighborhoods. As more and more Aucklanders move up, we're sorry. <laughs> but to welcome in. When I was one, I had my birthday in a Salvation Army uh, house. We were on the way back from Perth to Sydney and Sydney to New Zealand. And in New Zealand, my mum's family was complicated. And we had some people that came and picked us up, me and my sister, and took us on Friday afternoon and let us run havoc in their house all weekend. And I saw my mum at church on Sunday and dropped me and my sister off at kindy and, play, and school on Friday morning. And who knows what happened with my mum there. But in that space, she truly found God. Because there were a family of people who brought in a young mother with two kids who were geniuses and just perfect all the time and never <laughs> broke into cupboards and ate chocolate. And they loved her. For more than one day, for more than one week, for more than even three months. And at Blockhouse Bay Baptist, I turned up in my 30s and a lady looked at me and looked at me and looked at me and looked at me and went, oh, you're Vanessa's. Do you remember me? And I'm like, no. Nope. She's like, oh, you stole chocolate from my cupboard. And I'm like, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Still don't remember her. Don't remember the chocolate either. Are we willing to know our neighbors, to know enough who is new, and to be obedient of what God is asking us to do and what we know God asks of us? And while we don't have gleaning laws or live in an agrarian society, is that something that we are willing to do? To love God with all our hearts and our minds and our souls and love our neighbor? And what happens if our labor doesn't look like us? If our neighbor is the solo mom with one or three or five kids? Or if our neighbor is a Moabitess, someone that hasn't followed our laws or looks like us? Or someone who is a sojourner, a traveler to our land and has no home? Are we willing to, like Boaz, invite them in and give something of ourselves to them? I want to say there is something still about these gleaning laws, while not as simple for today, there is a way for us to practice them. And I know this because there are many clever people in this room, many of you, all of you. And if I asked you to have a think, which I am, about how potentially we as a church could work out these gleaning laws in a way that it meant that there was enough for the widow or the orphan or the one who needed it or for the sojourner or for the one among us that had lack, there would be a way for us to figure that out. So church, can you help me figure it out? I am only one among the cleverness of this room. As the last count, and there's like 144 of you, and 144? About one, hang on, she's coming. One, one, three, five. So there's 135 clever people in this room. Let's try and figure it out. That we don't just like ignore these bits of scripture and go, ah, oh, yep, cool. There's got to be a reason why we still have the story of Ruth and Boaz. The story, the reason why we still have these books of the laws of Deuteronomy. They seem so boring, but can ask of us and remind us of so much. There is something about being able to give away, to care for and protect and take care of, which was what Boaz did. For those who, for whatever reason, can't take care of their own needs, without th saying things like, well, if they could just pull themselves up from their own bootstraps. They just worked a little bit harder. And I'm not trying to start a political fight with you. I don't care how you vote, and I never will. Because this is not a conversation about politics, but an issue of our hearts and of our obediences to what God has asked us to do. Do we really believe that God is our provision, just like Boaz did? Are we really willing to say that God is our all in all? The 
This is a struggle that I have constantly. I have grown up, not in the easiest of circumstances, but I always had food. And I went to good schools that encouraged me, and I've been employed by good churches who've paid me well, and I live in a very comfortable house. And what do I do with these blessings when I don't live in my agrarian society? Yes, sure, come and take a tenth of my taro plants, please. But church, what can we do as people that God has blessed? And I'm not just talking financially, though I think that's a very strong, holy thing among us that we like to hold on and find strength and security in. But I'm also talking about the blessings we have in Christ. Are we willing to talk about those and share those as well? For those of us who've lived in Christian communities our whole life, can we encourage and speak of faith to those who may be a bit tired? Can we tell those stories about God has been faithful when it doesn't seem like he's turning up in other people's life? Can we say, just hold on a little bit longer. I know he is faithful and here is a story. How do we live as blessed people to bless others? And there's got to be a way, guys. There's got to be a way. We are clever enough to figure it out because I don't like the alternative at all. I do not like it. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells this parable of the rich farmer who with his wealth does not bless like Boaz did, but built more barns. And in his pride and with his security placed in these barns with all the grains and fruits, it says that he died that night. With his barns completed and full, he dies. And what's the point of that, right? We're blessed to be a blessing, not blessed to have security. And with all our blessings, our faith and our finances, our skills and our talents and our gifts, we are called to give. So church, let's figure out how to be a blessing. If we are called to be a if we are blessed to be a blessing, let's figure it out. And I know we already do it in ways and means with Arataki and Four Cs and mainly music we use, our gifts, but oh man. I can only dream of what we could be. And perhaps, church, we can be Boaz's as a church together, but also as individuals in non-agrarian cultures. Now, if you do happen to have a field, you know, open it up. Uh, gleaning laws are all the rage in Europe, in England, in America at the moment. Farmers are like, yep, we're going to do this gleaning law things. And it's interesting as they see communities coming together, but what is it for us that work or don't work, who have fields or gardens and don't have fields or gardens? What is it for our bank accounts or our skills or potentially, I think, our time <laughs> that we could give away, that we might be a blessing as so we are blessed? So church, the story of Ruth is more than a love story. It is more than just waiting for the man to arrive and fix everything. But there is goodness in Boaz that we can pay attention to. And it is this goodness and these acts of obedience that are part of the bigger story. So let's be Boaz. As we are blessed, let's be a blessing. God, in your word, there is this first point, which it is you always first. It is you that created the heavens and the earth. It is you that led the captives out of Israel and freed them. It is you who put them in the land of the milk and honey. It is you, Jesus, who stepped out in heaven and welcomed us in and forgave our sins as family. It is you, Jesus, who we wait to see returning. It is you, Jesus, who we will see face to face one day and we will be welcomed home. And in all these movements, you... God, provide for us, and you give us all we need. And we are called to be obedient because of all that you have provided, because all that you have given, you ask simply of obedience. 
God, with our strength and our skill, with our finance and with our time and all the blessings that we have, how can we bless others? May your Holy Spirit enliven us and give us thoughts and ideas, spark conversation, and even challenge us where we are hoarding your blessings, where we are hoarding the gifts of you, when we are taking what you have given us and putting it in our own pockets. May we be challenged there as well. That like the people of Israel and like Boaz, we may be a blessing to others, knowing that you will give us enough, for you are our provider. Amen. Blessed people, God's chosen, welcomed into family and given provision of life everlasting and fellowship with God himself through Jesus' Son. Walk with full pockets and full hearts, knowing God's provision for you, God's love for you, God's grace for you. Walk with full pockets, knowing that it's time to spend them too. To spend the blessing that God has given you, your time, your energy, your will, your gifts, your talents, your money, your table, your taro plants. Knowing God is faithful to provide more than you need. Go with full pockets and empty them. Amen.